Hello everybody! Welcome to our next video for Advanced Calculus class. In this video we are going to talk about some more limit properties. These are very actually basic limit properties. Uh, it's really going to help us with sort of the algebra of limits. Uh, and, and then we'll have a few more things to say about how uh, limits work uh, in terms of uh, ordering, right? And that means in terms of less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. Uh, we'll talk about the squeeze theorem and uh, maybe something else. So uh, let's start with just a fundamental property, which we'll use all the time if we're manipulating complicated expressions with limits. So we're going to start here with two sequences, A and B. And of course, as usual, these are sequences of real numbers. And C is going to be some real number. Okay, oh, and I, I guess I, I always like to give a name here. This is going to be the Algebra of Limits Theorem. All right, so uh, I'm going to make some assumptions here about the sequences A and B, namely that they converge and that I know what they converge to. Okay, and this is a big assumption here. So if the limit of the sequence A is equal to K and the limit of the sequence B is equal to L, then I'm going to get the following three statements. Okay, and before I say them, you have to recognize the importance of these hypotheses, all right? What I'm going to write down below is what you typically want to use. However, you cannot use them until you have verified that the hypotheses are true, specifically that A and B are convergent sequences. All right, so the first one, this is sometimes known as homogeneity. That's a nice, nice word there for you, is that if I take the sequence C times A, so this means that I multiply every term in the sequence A by this fixed real number C, then I can ask, well, does that new sequence converge? All right, and if it does, what is its limit? And the answer is that it will just be C times the limit of A. All right. Okay, so this is where the homogeneity is coming from. I can pull the C out through the limit. And this is going to be a big deal when you're studying analysis, whether or not you can swap uh, constants or functions, whatever, with a limit or with a derivative or an integral, etc. Okay, so this says if I've multiplied a sequence by some scalar, if the original sequence converges, then the new sequence converges, and the limit is just going to be the original limit times that scalar. All right, the second statement is sometimes referred to as additivity. And that says if I take the limit of the sequence I get by adding the sequences A and B together. All right, so this means term by term. I take the first term of A and the first term of B, add them together, and I get a new sequence. And the claim is that that also will converge, and it will converge to precisely the sum of the limits of the original two sequences. So in this case, that would be K plus L. All right, now I'm just going to toss in here Another word, <laughs> multiplicativity. Multiplicativity, okay, there we go. And I get that by, instead of adding two sequences together, I could multiply two sequences together. So that's a, this dot here, right? I'll maybe make it a time symbol, right? So what I could do is take term by term the terms in the sequence, multiply them together to get a new sequence. And I could then ask, does that new sequence converge. And the answer is going to be it does converge, and it converges to precisely the product of the limits of the original sequences. All right, so in this case, k times l. All right, finally, and I almost wanted to put this as a part of number two, uh, but instead uh, I pulled it out because there's, there's at least one, I don't know, extra thing to be thinking about here. Uh, so we're going to call this divisibility, or I really should say sort of one and a half divisibility. 
which is what you might have suspected it was based on additivity and multiplicativity. What if I took these sequences and I divided them, and by that I mean term by term. I look at A1 over B1, and A2 over B2, and A3 over B3. Okay, and assuming again that A and B converge, then this limit will be the same thing as the quotient of the individual limits, or K over L. Now, there has to be something a little extra here, right? In fact, a couple of little extra things because I'm dividing. And whenever we divide, we have to be certain we're not dividing by zero. And if this sequence B converges to zero, then we have a serious problem. So we need to have the caveat as long as L does not equal zero. If L is equal to zero, then we, we have to think more. Uh, now, there's a little more that we're really gonna have to say about this because uh, already the fact that we defined this sequence B0 as being now the denominators of a new sequence, that also is potentially going to cause some problems. So I'm going to do an example, and then we'll come back and, and handle that point. All right, so let's do an example of using some of these laws. So let's let our first sequence A be the sequence whose nth term is 5n minus 1. So here n will start at 1. And b is going to be the sequence 3n plus 1. And again here n starts at 1. All right, so our good friend, Clever Carl, remember Clever Carl is never right, our good friend Clever Carl writes down the following. So Clever Carl says, or writes, the limit of a over b, okay, so this sequence, a dot over b dot, equals, okay, so we would take the limit as n goes to infinity of 5n minus 1 over 3n plus 1. So I've just replaced a dot with b dot. All right, this is the nth term. And now I let n go to infinity. All right, well, by property 3, he says, we get the limit as n goes to infinity of 5n minus 1 over the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n plus 1. Ah, the limit in the top is infinity, right? As n goes to infinity, so does 5n. Subtracting 1 doesn't help you. On the bottom, as n goes to infinity, so does 3n. Adding 1, well, still going to infinity. So this is infinity over infinity, which we know does not exist, right? So which doesn't exist. All right. Now, Carl is very proud of himself, by the way, because uh, he used to think that if you got infinity over infinity, that, that equaled one, right? You divide something by itself. All right. So he's very happy because he figured out it doesn't equal one. All right. So what is clever Carl doing wrong here? Well, I said that this was an example, but so far this is actually a non-example. Yeah? And, and what is the non-example? Well, remember the assumption, right? We have to check the hypotheses. The assumption is that both of the limits exist, right, for the original two sequences. And here we have sequence A, 5n minus 1, right? That doesn't converge. As n goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. The same thing is true with, with B. It has it diverges to infinity. So we cannot use part three of the theorem because part three of the theorem assumes when you break it up that these two limits already existed in the first place. So how can we help Carl out here? What, what should he have done? How do we make this into an actual example? Well, okay, the actual example, you'd have to do a little algebraic magic. We'd say, all right, we want the limit as n goes to infinity of 5n minus 1 over 3n plus 1. So we play a little game. We're going to factor an n out of the numerator and the denominator. So the limit goes nowhere, and I get n times 5 minus 1 over n. Okay, 
Note, if I distribute the n back in, I get n times 5, okay, that's 5n, minus n times 1 over n, which is 1. And I do the same thing on the bottom. Factor out an n, and I get 3 plus 1 over n. All right, now, as n is going to infinity, right, we know that's what's happening, and in fact, even as n started at, you know, at 1, we know n does not equal 0, and so I'm allowed to cancel these two n's. And so now I get the limit as n goes to infinity of 5 minus 1 over n over 3 plus 1 over n. Now, I would like to use this divisibility law, but that requires me now to check, do each of the individual pieces, the numerator and the denominator, do those sequences converge? So let's handle those separately. The limit as n goes to infinity of 5 minus 1 over n. 1 over n, okay, and then it's just a second one, the limit as n goes to infinity of 3 plus 1 over n. Now, by the additivity law, if I know that the individual pieces converge, then the sum, or really you could think of the difference, will also converge. And in this case, well, 5, that doesn't change at all as n goes to infinity. So that definitely converges to 5. And this piece over here, you can think of this as plus uh, negative 1 over n, as n goes to infinity, negative 1 over n goes to 0. And so by the algebra of limits, part 2, we know that this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 5, plus the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 over n. And the first bit is 5, and the second bit is 0. All right, so we know that the first sequence converges, all right, this, this numerator. All right, and using the exact same reasoning, we would get that this bottom piece, all right, the 3 goes to 3, the 1 over n goes to 0, and so in total this goes to 3 plus 0, which equals 3. And so this means we really can break this up as the limit as n goes to infinity, of 5 minus 1 over n over the limit as n goes to infinity of 3 plus 1 over n. And we know the two limits are 5 and 3. All right, so that's how we can, we can handle this. Now, uh, once you get good at this, you don't write down all these details. But in the meantime, before you're really good at this, right, you have to check whether or not all these hypotheses hold. And that's why we're, we're showing all this extra work here. OK, cool. Uh, so let's go back, though, and check this, this last line of the algebra of limits theorem, this divisibility, right? So if B is some sequence where you actually get a bunch of zeros in the sequence, then it doesn't even make sense, as I've talked about it, to define this sequence, right? Because you might have, okay, uh, 3 over 1, 4 over 1.2, 5 over 0, 6 over 0, blah, 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 and it goes on and on. Well, all those times where I said over 0, we're kicking puppies, and that's no good. So uh, the way we're going to handle things in this case is to look at the tail, all right? We're, we're not going to, we're basically going to cut off the parts of A and B that would correspond to where B actually has a zero term. And so in order for that to make sense, we, we need a little theorem here. So the theorem is that sequences not converging to zero, okay, which is, this is relevant because we assumed, right, that B does not converge to L, or B does converge to L, but that L is not zero. So B does not converge to zero. So sequences not converging to zero have a non-zero tail. Okay, meaning I can find some tail where I no longer get zeros. Okay, so the statement is that if B is a sequence such that the limit of b is equal, or not equal rather, to 0, then 
there exists a tail of B, none of whom's terms are zero. Uh, whom's apostrophe? No, let's just say whose. <laughs> none of whose terms are zero. Okay. Uh, in other words, okay, so IE eventually B not has no zero terms. Okay, now if eventually we have no zero terms, then the zero terms have to stop after some point. There's only a finite number of them. So in particular, B has only a finite number of zero terms. Okay, so that can be handy. All right, so uh, what that means is if we want to define the limit of A dot over B dot, and B dot does not have, uh, does not converge to zero, then what we should do is define this, right? So this is a definition then. We define this as simply the limit of the tail sequences, okay? Where this tail has no zero terms. Okay, that's going to be the, the key. Okay, so that's just a little technical uh, issue that we deal with, right? But again, because the idea with sequences is we really only care what eventually happens, there's no damage in defining such a limit in this way. Okay, uh, next theorem, okay? And, and by the way, this theorem, uh, you know, uh, is going to be left as a homework exercise for you, uh, the, this previous one. But this next theorem is going to relate. Uh, it's going to relate our sequences with our less than or equals to, which we know is a big deal for us. So this theorem is called the ordering of limits theorem. Okay, and so once again, uh, we're going to have two sequences A, which let's just say is a sequence converging to K, and B which is some sequence converging to L, okay? So I'm, uh, I could also use the limit notation, but okay, this is fast. So first, if we know that A is eventually non-negative, right? So if eventually I don't have any negative terms in my sequence, then K is non-negative. Okay, so I can't have an eventually non-negative sequence converge to a negative number, which that should seem pretty reasonable. All right. Um, next, if the terms of sequence A are eventually, and again, you'll notice we keep using eventually, because why? That's right, sequences we only care about eventually. So if the terms of A are eventually less than or equal to the terms of B. Okay, so if eventually the sequence A is really less than or equal to the to the sequence B, all right? So in, in math symbols, right? A n less than or equal to B n for all n greater than or equal to some big N, right? Some positive integer. Okay, so if this eventually happens, then we know that A converges to K and B converges to L, and if eventually A is less than or equal to B, then K has to be less than or equal to L. All right, third. If A is eventually bounded... Oh, wait a second, didn't I say... In a previous video that, that doesn't make any sense. 
to talk about eventually bounded. I mean, it makes sense. It's just no different than just saying bounded, right? Well, I'm going to add some more stuff here, which is going to make this eventually bounded make actually a distinction from just bounded. So if A is eventually bounded from above by some real number C, okay? So this is the difference. The beginning of my sequence might go very much above C, okay? So maybe my C is 100, but I start at 1,000 in my sequence. Well, then my sequence is not bounded from above by 100, right? Because there, I have a thousand at the at the beginning. But if I go out far enough, I may not get anything bigger than a hundred anymore, right? They all might get smaller, all in the 90s or something. So that's what I mean. That's why I want to distinguish here being eventually bounded from above by this C. So if I am eventually bounded from above by C, then what A converges to, this K, has to be less than or equal to C, right? And of course, we get the sort of the dual statement about B, or well, anything really, doesn't matter if it's B or A, but if B is eventually bounded from below by some real number, say D, then D is less than or equal to L, right? Which is what B converges to. Okay, so this is, these will all just be part of your toolbox, right? You need to use them all the time dealing with these sequences. All right, and the last thing we'll write down, this should be a theorem that you're very familiar with from your calculus days. This is called the squeeze theorem. Okay, so the squeeze theorem is going to start now with three sequences, A, B, and C, so these are sequences, and we're going to assume that A converges to some K, but also that C converges to some K. Okay, so we have two sequences with the same limit. And if eventually, okay, remember we don't really care what happens in the beginning, so if eventually all of the terms of A become less than or equal to the terms of B, and all of the terms of B become less than or equal to the terms of C, okay, so for N greater than or equal to some big N, then this sequence B also has to converge to K. All right, so you have this idea here where the A terms are converging to K, the C terms are converging to K, and B, being in between those gets squeezed in the middle and also then has to converge to K. All right, so this is a lot of limit stuff, a lot of sequence stuff, right, that we're, we're going to need uh, going forward. Uh, in our next video, we're going to go to a very specific type of sequence called a Cauchy sequence, which is going to give us another answer to the question, how do you determine whether or not a sequence converges when you don't know what the limit should be? All right, we'll see you next time.